these classes, these teachings, are all about you, me, being different. And when I say that, there's no way you can have a right reaction to it. I said these classes are for us to become different inwardly, spiritually, mentally, actively, life-wise. There's no meaning to you. None at all. It's a word. I said, they're for you to be different. You know the word. You know what the word is. You know the difference between apple pie and peach cobbler. There's a difference. The word means there's one state, and then there's a different state, another state, another object, another place. So when I say these classes are for you to be different, there's a blank reaction. The reason there's a nothing reaction is because you only know one state, one way to think, one way to meet life, one way to view yourself. There's just one thing. So the idea of something being different has no meaning. Do you remember I said last night, among other things, that you can only know how you are how you were when you're no longer that. If you've climbed up 15 stories in a 25-story building, one first story, second story, third story, then when you're on the 15th story, you can look back and describe the 14th story. There's offices there. The 13th story is a warehouse type of floor. No, no. You can describe where you've been, but you don't know where you're going. So now I'll repeat what I said, and then we'll go into something that will illustrate the whole idea. Understand then, at the start, that you don't know what it means to be different from what you are. All you know is a new version of the old tragic biography of your lives. It's rewritten just a little bit described a little bit different, a little bit emphasis on this sorrow instead of on that sorrow. There's no new life at all. It's merely a rewrite, a, re a revision according to your own moods of the moment. It's only the old life said in a new way, and it's new even with the same old words. All right, there was a man sitting in front of his house one day, having nothing to do, and not knowing what to do with himself. Just sitting there, looking out at life in a dull way, a dull gaze, which is the way everybody lives their life. Sitting there, and pretty soon, several cars came down the street, five or six cars, with, packed with people. And instantly, some outside object moved into the line of his vision and like most people you mechanically turn and you look and see what's coming down the street which he did and he was very grateful for that because he, he couldn't consciously move his vision up to the tree over there or even down to see that his shoe was untied or he couldn't see that the grass out in front of his yard there he couldn't move his even move his head physically consciously so he was very grateful that something outside said, caught his eye and said, move this way and look. All I have to do is follow the leading of exterior objects. So the cars came down the street and he looked over at them mechanically and he recognized that they were filled with all his friends. It must have been about 20, 30 of his friends packed in all these cars. And they slowed down in front of his house yelling, hey! Come on out, we've got something exciting to tell you. 
No, he was excited, too. Just the invitation alone was enough. The fact that they, the fact that they said his name, that was exciting. Because he thought he was his name. And every time his name was said, he thought, hey, that's me. Which it wasn't, but he didn't know that. So he excitedly walked out. Well, oh, I wonder what it's all about. We're going to a party. We're going to go on a trip down the beach. I wonder what we're going to do. So we went out, and um, one of the men in the car said, hey, guess what's happening today? And he said, tell me what's happening today. And they said, this is the day of the cross-country race. He said, what? The cross-country race, once a year, everyone can enter, young, old, male, female, anyone at all wants to enter the great cross-country race. So we're all going down there. We thought it'd be fun. Nothing else to do with ourselves, so we'll go down. He said, fine, just a minute, I'll go get my track shoes. So he ran in, came out, got them in the car with him. And they all were excited about this forthcoming cross-country race in which they were going to run through pretty country, they believed, and come out at the end of the race. And it was a long race, he was told, a long time, much longer than average two or three hour or even several hour marathon race. Went on for a long time, days, weeks even. So they got the place and sure enough, there was an enormous crowd of people all in their track clothes, track suits, track suits some with caps on, some bareheaded, some of them limbering up. There was the starting line with the officials with their caps and their starting pistols. They all got a drink of water and all lined up, given the instructions. Keep going, whatever you do, now keep going on the race, don't fall out. So he got in, this man got in with his friends all together in the same little group up toward the starting line, but they were back too because there was an enormous number of people starting out, thousands as a matter of fact because they all thought it'd be exciting to get into the race. Bang, starter's pistol went off. Off they started to jog. You know, in a, a long distance race, you don't zoom out. You have to pace your energy, so you start at a medium pace and keep it up. You can judge how fast or slow you can go. Your own body and your own breathing tells you how fast or slow you can go naturally, normally. So they started out. And it was great fun. First few miles, they was on fairly level ground. Then it dipped down a little bit and went through some, across the meadow and then up a hill, and down through some rocky canyons. Very interesting, a lot of fun. And his, he and his friends joked with each other, you know, you save your breath, but a quick little joke and go on again. Went on, on and on and on. And as it went on for several hours, he looked around and he saw that uh, his friends were no longer near him. And he wondered about it a little bit, but not too much, because another mile later he looked around and there they were again, but in back then. And a lot of strangers, some in front of him, some in back then. But he was really enjoying himself. This is, this is fun. I'm glad they invited me into the race. Went on, on, on again. This time he looked around and looked ahead and his friends weren't anywhere around there. They're all gone. He wondered, I wonder if uh, it was too much for him if they've dropped out of the race. And he noticed that a lot of other people had dropped out too. Some of the strangers that he had seen at the starting line, they were, got tired and stepped off the side. He knew they were all through. On and on and on. He was pacing himself, judging his strength. But he did feel a little lonely. All his friends that uh, he joked with a little bit and kept in company, they were gone. So he was, for a long time now, he was all alone jogging through the countryside. And also, the race which had start, started off on such level and easy ground was getting a little more rugged, going up some pretty steep mountains, down some steep hills, and he slid quite a bit, and he fell down quite a bit had to cross streams, had to go through dark woods in which the, even the bushes seemed a little menacing all alone, and there were these high bushes on this dimly marked trail. So his discouragement began to mount a little bit until 
To his delight, when he broke into an open space, he saw alongside the trail a long table. And alongside the table, well, was uh, some people, some strangers, and they had all kinds of food and water on the table, you know, like they do in a cross-country race. Ah, he felt relieved. I'm not alone after all. So, as you know, in a, a race, you don't stop. You just slow down just enough to grab the water and swig it a little bit and jump it on your hair a little bit because it's pretty hot out. Then you throw the bottle aside. That's not called littering because someone picks it up. You throw the bottle aside and you go on the right. So he went on a little bit refreshed, but he felt refreshed, but he was conscious, that, uh, very much conscious that he was now completely all alone. He, he knew now for sure that all these enthusiastic friends that he'd started out with had dropped out of the race. Well, they just couldn't take it, and he was pleased that he was able to continue with it. On and on and on, all alone. Now it got rough again, but every once in a while there'd be one of these tables with refreshments on it. He'd grab it and run, so he was doing all right. He wanted very badly to finish the race. But he did, ladies and gentlemen, listening to this, listen to this. What bothered him was he didn't know how long it was going to take. And he kept asking himself, I wonder how long the trail is. Will I finish in two days or was it two years or ten years? And he, he looked around for someone to ask. There was no one there. So that was, that was quite bothersome that he didn't know when he would be through. Because in his normal life, his business life, he would know that he'd be through work at 5 o'clock or through painting the roof at 3 o'clock or whatever. There were definite times, and the uncertainty of it burdened him quite a bit. But contrary to his discouragement was another part of him that said, I'm, I'm going to finish this race. Whatever it takes, I'm going to finish. I, my friends don't want to. That's up to them. Or the strangers want to drop out. That's up to them. I, I personally want to finish, so I'm going to keep going. And that, that very feeling gave him, gave him more, more strength, more pep to keep going. So he kept going on and on. And then he came to a second surprise. At a certain open space, there was the usual tables lined up, lined up alongside the trail with water on it, food on it. And lo and behold, in back of the tables were all his friends that had started out the race with him, started the race with him. And he was surprised, but he figured it out logically. He said, well, they didn't want to continue, so they went back and got their cars, and thankfully they decided to put the tables out there to help me. So as he ran up to them, they smiled at each other, and he grabbed some water and drank it, poured it all over and threw it back, and they waved at each other, and off he went on them. His strength was doubly revived by seeing his friends there who were out to help him. Another 10 miles, he got to slow down a little bit, get a little thirsty and a little tired. Sure enough, there was another group, four or five people behind the table, the people who had started off with him, who had stopped in the car originally at his home. There were they out there offering and encouraging him, come on, you can make it, you can finish. We didn't, but you can. Congratulations for your endurance. And it revived his spirits. On and on and on. Are you aware, by the way, to interject that the race goes on and on and on and on and on? That's good. You're still racing, huh? So now a week had passed. And at a certain point where he was jogging along, judging his pace, not too fast, not too slow, he became aware that his breath was becoming a little short. He was having a little trouble breathing. And it bothered him a little bit because he knew that 
he'd been on level ground. He wasn't going uphill, which is where you'd normally breathe a little harder. And it bothered him a little bit. But there ahead with his friends with the refreshment, so he went over and got something, went on his way. He felt a little better now. Then he noticed a few miles further on that he was felt a little dizzy. Just just enough to notice, just barely enough to notice. There's a dizziness in his head which transmitted itself to his legs and his arms and his eyes and began to weave a little bit along the path. But he caught himself in time, brought himself up and continued on. A few miles further, he began to get really worried because he was feeling actually sick, actually feeling sick, but he couldn't figure out. He's wondering whether it was going to make him drop out, which he didn't want to do, so now he's in conflict and in discouragement. But he smiled inwardly as he saw a mile ahead. There was his friends with the refreshments on the stand. That picked him up, and he forgot his dizziness and ran ahead and got some water and got a little food, something to snack on, candy bar, went on his way. He couldn't kid himself after the next few miles. He was sick. And when you're sick, you don't run very well. Your legs just don't cooperate, and your whole system wants to sit down and rest, or maybe worse than that, collapse. Struggled on. Another refreshment stand by his friends went on and on. Finally, he, at a certain point, he, he got so ill that he just came to a stop and just collapsed alongside the trail. And he's laying there for a while, unable to get up, actually unable to get up. He was so weak. A certain thought tried to press itself in on his mind, and he wanted to push it back. But the thought persisted, and it kept trying to push itself into his consciousness to make him see something. But he didn't want to see it, so he pushed it back, and he laid there, and he suffered physically and emotionally, mentally. The thought kept pressing, 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 and he kept saying no to it. But it kept saying yes, and the yes was stronger than his no. Finally, Having relaxed and admitted the thought, having surrendered to it, it rushed into his mind. And his eyes widened and his mouth dropped. And he gasped at what he realized. He realized that his dear friends were poisoning him. No pushing it back anymore. No denying it. No smiling and thinking, well, would people like that do a thing like that to their good friend? He knew they would. And curiously, he, he was intrigued, fascinated, by what that realization did for him. He had new strength. He had new confidence. Enough to get up, stagger up, and stagger for the first half mile. Then his, his legs get a little steadier and a little steadier. Till he came to the next refreshment stand alongside the road there was his friends again and he was still a, a half a mile away from them as he started to jog toward them and while jogging he was wide awake alert figuring thinking investigating the whole situation he was trying to remember 
exactly what had happened as he had previously ran up to the refreshment stands operated by his friends. And he figured it out exactly, logically, in his mind. And here, here, here's what he saw had happened. <clears throat> he was tired, and he wanted refreshment. And he was delighted at the sight of his friends who were going to help him, he thought. And so he ran up to the refreshment stand. They put out a plastic bottle of water. They held it out to him. And then his part was to reach out and take it. Then he drank. That, that was the exact physical, mechanical process that happened. He ran up. They offered it, he took it, he consumed it, and then he got sick. And now he knew what he had to do to keep going in the race. And you'll make connections with this, and if you don't, I'll help you a little bit later. He understood that he didn't have to take them if it was offered. If someone puts out your hand to offer you poisoned water, tainted water, tainted food, only if you lack knowledge about the poison in the food and water will you take it. Only if he was ignorant, only because he was ignorant did he take it and get poisoned and get thrown out of the race temporarily. He ran up to that stand, and all his friends, five or six of them there, men, women, young, old, all ages, they smiled at him as he started to approach them. They cheered him on, and they held out the water, and as he got close to them, a great agony went through him. he knew what he had to do and you know what I'm talking about too but you had better practice it he knew what he had to do and what he had to do is not smile at his friends and not put out his hand and what he had to do was to run right by but he he knew what he had to go through, what he had to go through was he, as he approached them and they smiled and held it out and they cheered him on and they called him by his name for him to not smile back and to keep his head and face and feet headed straight ahead along the trail. Being conscious of the fact that as he did that, the smiles and the enthusiasms and the shouts of encouragement were absolutely going to change and fade out. And even when he didn't look at them as he passed that stand and didn't take what they'd offer, he knew what the expressions on their faces were. What do you think their attitudes would be in the facial expressions? What do you think they would have to be of people who are trying to poison him? It, it just so happens that in, it's an act of violent hatred to try to poison someone. And people with violent hatred in them have animal looks on their faces and they have animal feelings inside them. He knew how they would change. But he also knew something else. He knew that he wanted to, to finish the race. And he did. 
see. Look. Who do you live with? Huh? I'm asking you personally. Who do you, you live with someone? All right. Well, maybe you do, maybe not. Who do you associate with? And a man's foes shall be of his own household. I think there are some husbands and wives in this room. And I think there are some friends in this room acquaintances, associates. These dear people are holding water out to you. And you are reaching out and taking it because you don't know the nature of that other person. You think they're your dear friends? They're doing the same thing to themselves. That water that they're holding out to you is the same water that they drink. Someone comes up to you in this room, right in this room. Someone comes up to you and you have known them for years. They come up to you and they, and they make a gloomy remark. They make a defeated remark that's handing out the poison water and you react to it because you think it's necessary to take it. That person who is poisoning himself with their own water that he's handing to you, he doesn't say consciously, I am giving you poison water because he doesn't know he's taking it himself. Remember how we've emphasized that no one ever consciously goes against his real interest, his true interest. All right. Your responsibility is to notice how dizzy you are along the cross-country trail. Notice how you falter. Notice how doubtful you get, how lonely you get, how scared you get. And then you had better for your sake, if you want to continue with the race, if you want to finish the race, which you can do, you'd better examine what's being given to you by your dear friends and your dear relatives. And I'm telling you that if you really see, if you have the, the deep knowledge that you're being poisoned only because you reach out your hand and accept it. If you have that knowledge, that knowledge by itself is enough to prevent you from reaching out and accepting what they are giving you. Oh, how beautifully and how fast the whole system revives when you cease to permit yourself to be poisoned. The poison, no longer being taken, goes away. You get purified and you get stronger. Your legs get, your spiritual legs get stronger. The whole system gets stronger. And you can see, you can see, even on the elementary logic, why is it is, why it is happening to you. Because you dared something. And you dared something because you loved something. And what you loved was your own real life. More than the phony approval and encouragement of your friends. If they drop out of the race, they're going to try to poison you. And they have dropped out. Most of them. There may be exceptions. There may be exceptions to some in this room. I'm talking particularly about people outside of this class. Having dropped out, they are now an enemy, a mortal enemy, of anyone who wants to continue. You threaten them. 
They want you to be what they are. They have no choice but to want you to remain what you always were in the past and what they have decided to be forevermore. And they'll very, very cleverly set up all these refreshment stands along the way. And they know all the gimmicks. They know all the tricks. They know everything to do in order to keep you reaching out and taking. Effective as of once, then. You will remember this story today. You will remember it in one point in particular. And you will start during the break. You'll be conversing with other people right in this room. And I want you to notice what that other person says to you. I want you to be aware of his spirit, of, what, of why he said it. Of course, you're carrying this out in the world, too, beyond this class, but I want you to start at the break. And I want you to see if someone makes some little small negative remark. I want you to know, to notice, whether the poison bottle of water consists of a certain facial expression or of a certain manner, a certain defeat, a certain way in which the person carries himself. You might even get pleasure, you might even get pleasure over the negativity of another person and that pleasure which you have taken is the poisoned water. You might feel superior to someone or inferior to someone. You may not like someone, and you say, I don't like you, and that could be the poison bottle of water. Summary and conclusion. You will be offered poison water from everyone you meet according to their degree of sickness. There is a matter of degree, but I want you to know that everyone who has quit the race will get in their cars and zoom around and pretend to be your friends. And unless you listen to what I'm telling you, they will trick you. And you won't have sense enough to track back why you feel so weary why you feel so dizzy, why you're so discouraged, and why you feel so heavy. You won't make the connection between what you're intaking and what, you, what is offered to you alongside the way in the form under the guise of refreshment. Try to get the connection. And if you do, that will give you the strength to not, to, to withstand the assaults the, the viciousness of people who know you have seen through. You have seen through them. You know, you know right now, every one of you knows what will happen when you stop pleasing that sickie in your life. He's going to show his sickness. She's going to show her sickness. Please, for your sake, bear it. Don't you smile back. Don't you put out your hand. I don't care if there are 10,000 people lined up along there. They can't block your way on that path. It's, it, they quit it. It's not their path. It's yours. There's no way they can come out and block you. They can only reach out and offer you poison water. Keep your, keep your eyes straight ahead, keep your feet straight ahead, and keep walking. Nothing bad will happen to you. They, they can't touch you. <clears throat> they can touch you only if you weaken and want them to like you so you put out your hand and take the water. Don't do it. You don't have to. This will happen. Look, you've been given the idea, the principle. From now on, throughout the rest of your life, until you finally see what I'm see what I'm telling you, see it, deep insight, you're going to go past 
tables of all sorts with all kind of tricksters behind them, with all kind of things offering you, all kind of temptations and glamorizations to try to get you to drink. Don't drink. Keep running. You will see you will see that there was nothing, nothing really, really to fear from their wrath. Because I have told you, and I'll tell you again, they can scream at you, they can they can call you all sorts of names, they can call up your past tell you what mistakes you made. They can call you a hypocrite. There's one thing they cannot do, which is to block your path. They cannot get out there and stand in front of you. No way. So if you don't put out your hand, you're on the way. We'll take a 10 minute break and you'll be called back. If you don't have sense enough to arouse yourself, which you don't, then at least have sense enough to permit something else to arouse you. That something else is present in this room. It's been in this room present here tonight. And those who can feel, can feel it. Those who want it, can have it. You can't do much for yourself now on your own initiative because you don't know what right initiative is. Right initiative comes from seeing your actual condition as it is. The seeing of that arouses great energy. If you're in a house and a fire starts, seeing that fire gives you great energy to want to get out of there, right? You don't know your house is on fire. You really don't know it. You don't understand what that means. Your house being on fire means that you're in great pain. You're in great danger from yourself. You really are, as someone brought up. But you don't know you're in danger from yourself. You think the danger exists in all those bad people out there, that bad government, those, those bad enemies who won't give you what you want. You're in danger from those kinds of thoughts. You think those are guardian thoughts. You think that blaming someone else or something else are thoughts that protect you. They don't protect you. They keep you scared. They keep you lost. They keep you in tears. They keep you clinging to other people, to relatives, to governments, to phony social systems, to phony religions. They keep you clinging, and if you cling to anything, you're terrified. There's no security in anything on this earth except to know the truth and to live your whole life from that truth, independent of everyone else on earth, of every event, of every circumstance. <clears throat> to really live your life as you want to do it, not the sick you, but the you that's quite different from someone you presently live with. <coughs> Go ahead sometime. I told you to make a list. Add this little variation to it. Describe the kind of a person that you live with. Not your wife or husband. I'm talking about you. Describe him or her sometime. That's who you are stuck with. And there is a way to get unstuck. But not if you want to criticize in, in fear. Not if you want to reject the truth. Not if you're totally in love with yourself. Have you ever noticed that contradiction, by the way? You love yourself, and yet you hate yourself? Isn't that strange? Isn't that a clue? Isn't that something to investigate? how we get thrilled when someone flatters us or mentions our name somewhere. That's being in love with myself. And yet the next day my name isn't in the newspaper, I lose something, someone doesn't like me anymore, and I hate myself. Someday you can understand why you do both of these. And when you understand it thoroughly, you won't fall into automatic 
thinking anymore, and you'll be out of the trap. All right, we have lots of time for questions and comments. Herman, why do you think we sort of get into a state of being so remembering because the truth is being spoken? But if we made a special effort to self-remember, would more be absorbed? Absolutely, that's when you do absorb it. When your mind is filled with a, a, a raging thought, any kind of a self-centered thought, there's no entrance possible of anything higher than that thought. But when you're remembering yourself, you're being aware of yourself right now. Do it right now. Know that you're here in this room. Know that your physical body is here. Know where your hands are. Know the expression on your face. Notice whether your jaw is tight or loose. Just, just know that you're here. That, that's all. Yeah, look, look. Just know it. That's all. Now you're in a state of receptivity, of learning, and it will come to you. You'll know what to say. You'll know how to think properly. You'll know what to feel. And effortlessly, you will know what not to do. You'll see you'll see how many unnecessary things you've been doing that, thank heaven, you don't have to wear yourself out doing anymore. Explaining yourself to people so that they'll, they'll understand you, so that they'll understand me, so that they won't criticize me. Don't explain anything to anyone except on a practical level. I put extra salt into the stew because I thought it would taste better that way. Nothing wrong with that. Don't you explain your life to anyone else. They being sick will pounce on it and use it for their, to increase their own sickness. You keep your own counsel, I think it says somewhere. Keep your life to yourself. Don't tell people anything about your life. They're dogs, they'll gnaw at it and rip it apart. Society is a bunch of mad dogs just waiting for you to toss them a bit of information. They can rip for their own benefit. They'll tear you apart. They're waiting for an opportunity to tear you apart. But when you know that a mad dog is a mad dog and not a friendly guard dog, when you know it's a mad dog, you'll have sense enough to stay away from people psychologically even you have to work next to him down at the factory. You mentioned habits, and I can see where there is no power and no will in me presently to overcome habits. Oh. And it just, uh, when a person sees that, it leaves you with nothing, and it's a very uncomfortable point to be. I don't know what to do if there is anything to do after seeing that. If you will consciously surrender to your habit, it will lose its power over you. I said consciously surrender to your habit, it will lose its power over you. I'll give you a new instruction to see, let's see how much you, you can do with this. If you have a habit that you can't break, I want you to know that that there's fear of that habit in it. Correct so far? You, you know, I, have, oh, what's wrong? I want you to see that you fear the habit, and I want you to casually know that you fear the habit. When you know that you fear it, the power of the habit and the fear in it will gradually fall away. It won't happen overnight, but over a period of time, when you see that you and your fear are one, and then don't fight the fear in it and fight the habit itself it will indeed lose its power over you. All that can go. See, see what good cheer you should be. I am on the way There's no reason for anything but good cheer for the rest of your life. Nothing can dismay you. 
you you've heard it you've got it no one nothing can take it away not even your own deviltry can take it away if you stick if you persist if you love if you love truth more than you love darkness and even if you love darkness more than you love light right now you can begin to work so that that is changed and you will see you will really see how how you love to put rightness before your own temptations to think and feel what is wrong and you'll see the absolute power the absolute 100 percent of po the power of being true and that's god's trueness that is now entering right i can't be true you can't well i've tried i can't i can't do it no way i can do it but i can give up the wrenching of giving up the hell of giving up but you and I are going to go through it we're going to go through it a hundred times a day you can go through it you go through it a hundred times a day at the end of one month you'll feel yourself different you'll feel your life different and you'll you'll say you'll say thank god for god do you know what we have that if we have it that other people don't have which is not to our credit we know we know we have something higher than these daily activities. Look at the emptiness, the dismay of human beings who have something to live for in this world. Don't you know and don't I know that when you get all excited about something about tomorrow about a new project a new benefit don't you know that there's something inside of you that is saying that's just going to last for a week a month it's just going to last for a lifetime Look at the difference in two different people, two men, two women. One man is getting an airplane. He's made a lot of money. He's getting his airplane. And he's getting his a promotion down at the big factory. He's getting the new home. He's getting the new public honor. He's so enraptured with what's happening to him. Why then does he cry at night? Because he can't convince himself that it's real. There's no way he can. And this is his violence. He insists that these events, these fortunes, say this is you forever, but he knows he can't. Other man. Same thing happens to him, exactly the same thing. He gets a promotion. He's going to buy a new home. Maybe he gets an airplane because he wants an airplane that man has been listening to truth talking to him over the years when he gets the home and he gets the airplane he gets the promotion there's no conflict 
There's no despair. He knows, he knows that it will last a week, ten years. He knows that those things will last a lifetime. And when they fade away, as the treasures of this world will do, he's got something that there's no comparison. He doesn't even think about the home and the, the public honors. He doesn't even think that they have value. He knows he's gone through it. He's gone through what the other man has not gone through, what he refuses to go through. This man has died to thrillism. He's died to the excitement that says, now I'm alive. He's died to the false excitement over the acquisition or whatever. Do you know he may even, in one very special way, be very, very much involved in the affairs of the world? This is what he's doing with his life. This is what's coming his way. This is what he's doing. And he likes to be active. He likes to expand. He likes to increase his business. Cause, cause not because it's giving him eternity, because this is what he's doing while he's here on earth. See? The president of the factory that earns a million dollars, a billion dollars. The president of the factory that makes a billion dollars profit over the year. The man who doesn't know about these things, this is all he has. This is all he has. Therefore, he's afraid of losing the factory which is him. And then if he's going to die, which he is, he's going to lose his factory. Therefore, he's going to lose his life. So he builds a business and drives himself crazy and he's dishonest and he builds bombs in order to keep the lie going that if the factory continues, he will. But he can't succeed. Which is why one day he goes to the top floor of that factory and jumps off, maybe. He can't take the, the splitting anymore. He can't lie to himself successfully anymore, because he sees himself growing older. He sees his son's getting up and ready to take over, son's vice president. You know, someday his son's his name's going to be on the door as president, and he's not going to be there anymore. The other man, president of the factory down the street that also brings in a billion dollars worth of products to you, he gets up in the morning, goes down to the office, everybody fawns before him, all his lieutenants because they want raises and all that, want to please the boss. He knows it. Hi, Bill. Hi, Jim. Walks on in. He works. He enjoys his work. He does enjoy it. It's part of his inner life to enjoy his work. No problem. What difference does it make to him if you take the factory away? He never owned it in the first place. He knows the word, the phrase, my factory has no meaning. Great heavens, he knew that 20 years ago. His separation is complete. And he's the only one in the entire state who knows it. Nobody else knows it. Nobody else wants to know it. Nobody else is interested in it. Talk about a secret life. What a beautiful secret life. The reason no one else knows it is because he also learned a long time ago in his early pursuit of truth 
that if he was going to go a long, long, long way, he understood that if he was going to go a long, long way, he was going to have to go all alone. Leave, leave behind his old buddies down at the club. Leave behind all his relatives. Leave behind all the thoughts he had in his mind of being someone, of going somewhere, of accomplishing something. Leaving behind all forms of flattery. No, no one can ever say anything nice about him anymore and have him swallow it. No, it doesn't mean anything. You're not talking to anyone when you say anything either good or bad about him. He even discovered what you're going to have to discover, that he left behind one of his most present possessions, which is things to snap at. You can't snap at anyone. You can't have the pleasure, you can't have the, the pseudo-individuality of sniping at people. He learned that there's a false pleasure in that. It seems to be so sweet to strike out at someone. Don't you know that you chain yourself to anyone you strike out against? Don't you know when you hate someone, when you scorn someone, when you sneer at someone, that the chain is here and the chain goes out and wraps around their neck, but you are chained to that other person? Back to the point. Can you imagine the kind of life you would have if really in fact and not in words and not in quotations and not in religious sentiment, really in your life, the way you live inwardly, secretly, in your life, the world has nothing to give you, nothing to take away, it has no meaning to you. You're taking your meaning from a ten million miles from up there. And you know you are. You're not looking out to that world, to that, that person, that spouse, those children who you're afraid are going to disappoint you, and they will, because they can never live up to what you want them to be to make you feel all right, and they're not going to. And how ridiculous for you to expect them to, which is a form of your insanity. But you're walking right down that busy street in the business section, going up into that office, coming down again, or maybe going out into the fields where you work, working around the home. And you know, not in any conceit, not in any hypnosis of your own psychic system, but you know right now when you're sweeping that floor or you're preparing that advertising report. You know at the minute, the second that you're seated at that desk or taking care of the children, you know that you're in another world, an invisible world, a secret world. It's all yours and all any, anyone else who wants it. But it's your world, and it's a beautiful world because there's nothing more to get. When you have truth, when you have reality, you have to understand that that is the only contentment there is. You're not content, any of you here, because you haven't found what we're talking about. You may be seeking, and that's necessary. But you still cling to the hope that someone can hand it to you. And you still cling to the hope that your resistance to truth will somehow make, it, make you feel secure. Listen to what I just said. You hope 
that your blockage to the entrance of truth, that your coldness and your hiding out, and your being afraid, you sometime, somehow hope that that can endure. How, how can anything that comes out of a time mind, a time attitude, how can that endure? Time doesn't endure. Things in time pass. So look at the blunder you're making, unaware to yourself. Now you listen to this because I know you're doing it, and I'm looking at a number of you right while I'm talking that I know especially are doing this. Somehow you have picked up the wrong notion that hardness, fixedness, unyield, unyieldedness is your safety. And one characteristic of that, of course, is to have suspicious eyes, suspicious motives, and when anyone gets too close to your hardness, which seems to threaten it, like this, the truth comes close, then you cringe and harden up, and stay away, and then you say, ha, I've protected myself. That's like going inside the lion's cage to get some safety from the tiger. You're finding pseudo-safety and what you think is the protection of your savage nature. Haven't you seen it today tear at you? Haven't you seen yourself fight today? I'm afraid not. 99%, even if you're working on yourself. Because I see, I see you walking, and I hear you talking, and I know that beneath, that on the surface, you're putting on these exterior attitudes, the way you walk into this room, for example. And I know that that's a form of hard self-protection which is preventing you, even while you're seated here, and other people are not looking at you now, that's preventing you from hearing, absorbing, and changing. If you think, any of you, if you think you have any chance at all by coming here once a month or by coming here at every meeting and just sitting back and being lazy and letting it be fed to you, if you think there's any chance at all, let me tell you, you are making a mistake for your life. Now let's see. How do we get through to people? This class, the purpose is to get through to people. How do we get through to people who not only do not want to be invaded by truth and help, but don't know what I'm talking about right now when I say you're unconscious of your blockage, of your walls. Let's see, let's, let's talk, let me talk out loud. How do we get through to someone who not only does not want self-transformation, but doesn't know that he or she is resisting the truth that would like to get through and turn you into what it is? Having planted that thought, let's see where it takes us. One thought is this. It should be of no concern to anyone in this room, including myself, no concern 
personal concern of Vernon or Phyllis or Larry, no personal concern to us three, for example, as to whether any other person in this room does want the truth or not. My nature has no concern at all with whether my old nature has no concern at all, my individualized nature, Vernon, Phyllis Larry, has no really has any concern with whether you change or not. It is only self-centered. It wants what it calls change for itself, but it's mixed up on that. So anything that the name self does has no meaning. There's no such thing as compassion. There's no such thing as wanting to help another person understand these things. That's vanity. That would be my vanity or Larry's vanity to go around trying to help people. Oh, well, there must be some reason why we have these classes then. Then if there's no individual person anywhere in this room, who, named person, who cares for another, then what's this all about? Well, you can't know this until your name person begins to fade out so that you can begin to teach yourself. And there's no way then you can separate Larry teaching Larry or Phyllis teaching Phyllis from Larry teaching Mark, Phyllis teaching Henriette. They're inseparable. There's no such thing. Because it's one whole truth. Larry comes in here four or five years and he gets up here on Sunday or he walks back and either talks to someone or doesn't talk. And Ernesto who's known him for two or three years, sitting back in the corner, sees Larry walk. I only see one-tenth of one percent of change in Larry, but I know there's a difference. Larry, having taught himself, is teaching Ernesto. Ah, all right. So who's concerned? Who's concerned at all as to whether I change or you change inwardly? Only one thing. God, mm -hmm. something that is not a part of my time nature, something that is not a part of your time nature. Even to get that as a preliminary idea is extremely valuable. Because I can see that I can't, Vernon can't teach Vernon anything, Al can't teach Al anything. What I can do is stand apart and see there's no use in me trying to teach me. The awareness of that, the understanding of that is the beginning of the abandonment of egotism, trying to teach egotism to become non-egotism. Having understood that a false teacher, my name, your name, teaching others, either me or you, is only going to keep the thing going in the same old way, with the same old pain, with no chance of change, real transformation. Seeing that, the seeing of it causes me to gasp and stop. Then comes the first spark of insight. And we come back to the question I brought up a few minutes ago. Then comes the spark of insight. Who cares for me then? Using the word me 
consciously. Who then cares for me? Certainly not my mother or father. I mean my physical mother and father. I had to give that up. I had to pass beyond that childishness. Not the church. The church doesn't care for me. Even my fancies don't care for me. My fancies of religious terms and saying all nature loves me, all that nonsense. Even they don't care for me because they are me. I'm getting to a very frightening position where I'm beginning to see that everyone and everything that I had counted on to love me, to comfort me, to guide me, all that is gone. All dependency has to go away. Because I've seen there's nothing to it because it has all come out of my mind, my fancies, my imagination. And I begin to see that as I come to an end of myself, I begin to see and understand and be in great wonderment at what love really is. Vernon doesn't understand it, and Leland doesn't understand it, and Sherry doesn't understand it. We thought we did. We thought that dependency was love. We thought that jealousy was love. We thought that activity was love, or acquisitiveness was love. We thought that being with other people was love. We thought that, that religious dreams was love. And then we understand that if I had really been loved, I wouldn't have been so scared. Because when hey, you listen to me, when you know, when you know from yourself that you are loved, there's no fear. Your whole system is purified because you understand what love really is. It means the absence of you. It means the cessation of the flow of feelings and thoughts especially those that say, I love and want to be loved, or I love and am loved. The cessation of that, the ending of the fuel of neurosis, puts an end to all that. And having abolished all my personal efforts to love someone, which is self-interest, of course, which is wanting to believe in love on my terms so I can get from it what I want from it, security. Acceptance by you the way I presently am, all these things I want. And all, the <coughs> all these things kept me in a state where I knew I was unloved. You're unloved because you have no capacity to love anyone else. You have no capacity at all to care for anyone else. And that's why you feel abandoned. That's why you feel desolate. That's why you feel so far, far apart from a true source why your mind searches so frantically around trying to find a safe place. Why you sail into one harbor after another in your little life ship. When you go into that harbor, you're chased out by cannons on the shore wanting a friendly welcome. You've got cannons in that ship. So love, true love. 
I don't have to think about it. I don't have to wonder where to get it. I don't want, I don't wonder whether you're going to continue to be my friend or to be my wife or husband. In real love, thought has no place at all. There's no anxiety, no, no clinging. But what there is, is rest. A beautiful rest. You thought at one time, you were sure at one time, you were convinced at one time that if you sat back and stayed quietly home, you were sure that you would go crazy. You were sure that you'd be so desolate. At one time you thought this, but this was you thinking it. You still thought you had to do something to earn love, for example, to qualify for it. You have nothing to give. Imagine, imagine us arrogance on our part to think, me thinking it, or you thinking it, that we can go up to the throne of heaven and leave something of value. Can you imagine what delusion, what pure lunacy it must be for you and I to think that we can give anything to God? He doesn't even know us as we now exist because light doesn't know darkness. Truth doesn't know falsehood. Yet we think and we imagine, we, we, we think we're approaching truth. We think we can bring something to it. Our intelligence, I've told you and I'll tell you again, You own nothing whatever. How beautiful. If I own nothing, I don't have to acquire anything. I don't have to protect anything. I don't have to think about it. If I own nothing of my own, if I own nothing that's my personal possession, then what would I be? Then what would I have? Ah, this is where your work comes in. What could you consciously own if you didn't own your tendency to break down and cry on the slightest provocation? Oh, oh that's an interesting question. What would I own if I didn't own my precious treasure of rebellion? against the world because I feel it's cheated me of, of hatred toward the world. You, I, all day long today and all past days lived out our treasures whatever they might have been. Very trashy treasures. And this this is what you're going to give the truth. Now, you, you are not believing me. The thick walls in your mind, which you don't see, are insisting that you can come in this class or you can go before the throne of heaven and give something of value. What? What are you going to give? Your intelligence, my intelligence, we don't have any of our own. The minute we call it our own, it ceases to be intelligence. We're going to give our time. You ordered yourself to be born on January 8, 1940. 
you are in command of the time of your birth, for example. What are you going to give? Ah, that's a, isn't that easy to answer? Give up. Give up the delusion that you have anything of value at all. Even to think, even to think in the wrong way that you're a repentant sinner, even to think and to quote, because you've heard it so many times in this class, e even to quote, I'm fed up, and think that there's someone there who can be a fed up person. You're not a fed up person. There's no person there to be fed up. Ah. Thank heaven there can be an awareness of the futility of life as it is now lived. Thank heaven there is something inside of each one of us that can be willing to abandon ourselves regardless of the seeming cost. You don't know, you don't know what's going to happen to you if and when you give yourself up, that is, give up your delusion of having a self. You don't know what's going to happen to you. There's no way you can know and understand, comprehend. You can only know when you're willing to sacrifice prediction. When you're willing to say, I don't know, but I'm going to abandon myself anyway. I don't know, and you don't. How can you know what's going to happen to you when there's no you for it to happen to when you abandon yourself? So see the demand for security, for a new identity, for a new kind of self on the other side of the experience of letting go. The demand for that is a very cunning trick to hang on to yourself, and then you can go out and lie and lie and lie and say you've been born again. Lie and say you've gone through everything that, you've t that that man talked about in that lecture. You've passed through it. Now look, look what you have just heard in the last few minutes. You have heard knowledge which can turn into insight. So that as you continue to travel and you run into experiences, you run into decisions where you have to go one way or another, when you run into them, this knowledge will help you to make the right decision, which is always a letting go of decisions to take the left or right fork. Because if you take the left or right fork, you take the left or right fork. And then whichever one you take, you're going to run into the same experiences. If you take the left, you're going to get ego rewards and ego defeats. Right? If you take the right, you're going to get conceit rewards and conceit defeats. Same thing. Right? So all this knowledge that you've gathered tonight will enable you to go up to the, the Y in the road, go up to it, and be so silent that no decision is made at all as to which way you go. But you say, you say that's incredible, it's impossible, you have to make a decision, you have to go left or right. Who said so? You said so, and you don't have to believe in yourself. Not if you're really smart. So that when you get up to the 
crossroads. And you say, all my life I've had to choose left and right. I chose to get married. Then I chose to get unmarried. I chose to move to another state. And I chose to move to a second state. I chose this career or that career. When you get up to the crossroads like this and remain very quiet until you see that there's no one there who is compelled, who is forced to make a choice, you watch what happens. I'll tell you what will happen. But you have to experience for yourself. You, or me, my name, your name, my conditioning, walks up to the Y, the V, and the road. And instead of choosing this time, because I've seen the folly of choosing either left or right, I stand there and remain silent just to see what happens. And I'll tell you what will happen. Both branches of the road will disappear. That, that alternative coming from 10,000 miles up in the air never ever occurred to me. How can it occur to me? It can't occur to me. It could occur to something that isn't me. Because this light that has come down has dissolved the intellect, has dissolved the decision-making apparatus, so instead of making this decision or that one, the decision maker disappears. By the way, that's what is known as peace of mind. That's what is known as happiness. That's what is known as truly living your life instead of the life of a split mind that screams at you and says go left or go right you must make a choice or you'll perish we'll take a break and come back to this Fifty times a day, for ten years, twenty years, fifty years, we can say to ourselves, I am not conceited. I have banished conceit. We don't believe it. It's not true. It's not a fact. We've got conceit in us. Because I am saying that I myself, Vernon, Leland, Henry, I, my name, have banished conceit. So I'm not conceited, I'm really very modest, which is a thought, which is a lie, which is hypocrisy. Now, let's connect someone with what you're saying. After 20 years, 30 years, many, many years, you can say consciously, rightly with awareness with truth I am not conceited don't you say it to anyone else they're not going to accept it they're not going to believe you but you after all these years know you really really now I'm telling you this is a fact you really don't have conceit because when you said that, it wasn't Leland or Sherry saying, I have no conceit. It was an awareness of the absence of Leland or Sherry who used to say that, believing in it. You, you, you using the word you consciously, you know that you are no longer there saying the phrase there's an awareness of it but it's not you saying it bragging because there's no you there anymore and you know it 
And at a halfway stage, where you're still working toward, your, toward this absence of conceit, you'll slip, you'll make mistakes, and you'll say, in, in a certain crisis situation, maybe you get trapped by someone, caught out of a role, and you'll lie, and you'll say, no, I've abolished all conceit. But because you're still working, and you've worked halfway, and you're still going, you catch yourself in that lie, and you know that you said it. Vernon said it, or Chuck said it. But you're still working, so you catch it, and ask, I just told a big lie. I said, I don't have any conceit, and, and I know I do. And that was conceit <laughs> to tell a lie. See? So you sigh a little bit and say, whew, on I go, and on you go, on and on and on, till in some ways you see it very clearly at the start, like, as I said earlier, someone, someone says something nice about you or about a possession of yours, and you are looking at yourself, the moment that this person says this, you're watching your own reaction, and you are not there, and you know it means nothing to you. Someone says, you know, flatters your business uh, skill. Man, you started 20 years ago with $20, now you've got a $20 million. Congratulations, and the Chamber of Commerce wants to honor you and make you the businessman of the month and all that. That, em that emptiness is not yours because you know that if, you're, if you don't have a life of your own, which you don't, then certainly there is no one there to create that million dollar factory. That's the absence of conceit when you know that you never do anything from yourself because there's no doer there. There's no one there to do anything. It is simply being done. And you are one with that pure action. So that if life gives you the $20 million factory, well, I've got a $20 million factory for this life. I guess I'll go down and manufacture pretzels. <coughs> factory collapses, all your money goes, so there goes the pretzel factory. <laughs> 